Well, good morning. Second Peter, chapter one. Second Peter, chapter one. We started a few weeks looking at a passage of scripture, just one passage of scripture in Second Peter. A passage of Scripture that I think gives us a a discipleship strategy. It kind of gives us a progression of maturing as believers. And I wanted us to hone in on this passage of Scripture for several weeks and kind of walk through it together as a church family. And we we, we looked at the entire entire Scripture several weeks ago in 2 Peter 1, 2 through 15. And there, just to remind you, we saw that Peter basically committed the remainder of his life to driving home and stirring up the remembrance of the people in in his churches and uh, under his influence with three three things. He wanted to drive home to them, number one, the reality that God has provided for us, for them, everything needed for life and for godliness. He's provided for us precious and magnificent promises so that we can be partakers of the divine nature. He wanted to remind them of that. He also wanted to point out to them that because of these great graces from God, we must apply all diligence in our faith walk to add to our faith virtue or moral excellence, and to our moral excellence, knowledge, and to our knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly affection, and a brotherly affection, love. And then thirdly, he points out, if these qualities are ours, and if they're increasing, we will not be found useless. We will not be found unfruitful. But we will will not run the risk of falling away or, or going blind or nearsighted in our faith, but we will be granted entrance into the eternal kingdom. The kingdom will be abundantly supplied to us. Now, we've, we're spending several weeks walking through those qualities that Peter lists in verses 5 through 7. We've already unpacked the qualities of faith. We've already, already unpacked the quality of moral excellence last week. And now this morning, we come to the quality of knowledge. If you look in Second Peter 1 and verse 5, Peter says, Now, for this very reason... For what very reason? For the very reason that God has provided us everything pertaining to life and godliness, for the very reason that He has granted us precious and magnificent promises, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. Let us not forget, I don't don't want us to forget that knowledge and moral excellence flow out of God-given faith. God provides us the faith and out of that faith, out of that faith comes our moral excellence. And out of that moral excellence comes knowledge. It's in your faith supply. Out of your faith supply these things. So these these qualities that we're looking at in verses 5 through 7, these qualities of of moral excellence and knowledge and self-control and steadfastness and and godliness, these, these qualities should be present to an extent in every believer. And if these qualities are not present in any shape, form, or fashion in your life, that's a warning sign to you. Every one of these qualities should be present to an extent in the life of every believer. On the other hand, Peter tells us that we need to apply all diligence to go after these qualities. We can't just sit back on our blessed assurance and let whatever will be will be. No, we have to go after these qualities intentionally and personally apply all diligence to add the qualities in increasing measure to our faith because as these qualities are ours and are increasing, it's then that we get the promise that we will not be useless or unfruitful or blind. We won't run the risk of falling away, but rather we'll be granted entrance into the kingdom of God. We must, by God's grace, add to our moral excellence that we saw last week, knowledge. Now, speaking of moral excellence, Martin Lloyd-Jones says it is needed that this vigor, this energy, this activity 
of moral excellence be governed and controlled and qualified by intelligence, by understanding, by enlightenment. You see, if we come to faith and we get a boldness and an energy and a power that we talked about last week that is not followed with an increase in knowledge and understanding of truth, we can become a loose cannon. And we see that in our context. So Peter says, get this moral energy, get this passionate vigor of the soul, get this boldness of spirit, and then make sure you're adding to that and increasing in knowledge. And what kind of knowledge is this that Peter's talking about? Is this a knowledge of doctrine? Is this a knowledge of theology? Is this a knowledge of church history? Is this a knowledge of, of big terminology? You know, there's nothing wrong with doctrine, obviously. We want to learn solid doctrine. We want to learn solid theology. We want to know what church history teaches us. But we, we have kind of a plague almost, especially among young pastors who like to sit around in coffee shops or write blogs or put out Facebook posts using big theological terms and doctrinal terms to show off their smarts and their seminary degrees and are really accomplishing little to anything for the kingdom. They're just showing off their quote-unquote seminary wisdom. Adrian Rogers called those young guys that do that theologues. I don't think what Peter's talking about here are theologues, the theologues of our day. In fact, one commentator said a very different thing from the false, pretentious, speculative knowledge in which some were beginning to boast themselves. This isn't just a knowledge that we can boast ourselves in. What kind of knowledge is this that Peter wants us to grasp? And we need to understand this if we're going to understand what it is Peter is trying to teach us. This is not just a doctrinal knowledge, a, theo a theological knowledge, a church history knowledge, a knowledge of big words. I believe what Peter is referring to here is a knowledge, specifically a knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now let me show you why I believe that. If you look in 2 Peter chapter 1 and you go back to the first verse we covered in the whole context, in verse number 2, look at what it says. Peter begins this section of Scripture and he says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of who? Jesus our Lord. Let's look at verse number 3. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Who is the him that called us out of darkness into his marvelous light according to 1 Peter? It's Jesus Christ. Go down to verse number 8. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you turn over to 2 Peter chapter 2 and look in verse number 20, you read this. If after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge, they've escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, why did Peter tell us in chapter 1 that God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness and he's given us precious and magnificent promises so that we may escape the corruption that is found in the world and put on the divine nature? Now we come to chapter 2 and verse 20. He says, you escape those defilements of the world, those corruptions of the world by the knowledge of doctrine, theology, church history, big terminology, Specifically, no, the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse number 18. He says, but grow, increase in the grace and knowledge of who? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, when I look at 2 Peter, when I look at Peter's letter in its entirety, it seems that every time... He references knowledge. He's not just talking about a, a broad doctrinal knowledge. He's talking about a doctrinal knowledge of Jesus specifically. He's not talking about just a broad theological knowledge, though that's helpful. 
I'm not downing you if you have an interest in studying doctrine and theology as a whole. But what Peter is specifically talking about is the theology of Christ. I believe it's safe to deduce from what we've seen in Scripture that Peter has in mind not just any knowledge, but a knowing of Jesus. And, and, and listen carefully, I mean really knowing Jesus. Not as an extra, not as bonus points, but as if our very lives depended on it. Who Jesus is should define who we are. And if we know anything, if we leave here knowing anything this morning, let it not be the preacher, let it not be the music, let it not be the fellowship, but let it be Christ. There's two primary ways that we must know Jesus. Two primary ways that we must know Jesus. Now, I know my sermon only has two points, but don't get your hopes up. You're not eating early because each of those points come, they come with sub points, okay? The first point is biblically. We need to know Jesus biblically. And this is vitally important because many of us have fallen in love with the Jesus of our culture. Yes, we have a Jesus of our culture. Our culture has modified Jesus, and every culture does to an extent. We all have that tendency. Our culture's modified Jesus into a, an American Jesus. Many of us have fallen in love with the Jesus of our denomination. You know, we got a Baptist Jesus. Not just a Baptist Jesus, but a Southern Baptist Jesus. Not just a Southern Baptist Jesus, but a conservative Southern Baptist Jesus. Many of us have fallen in love with the Jesus of our church. Or the Jesus of our grandparents. Or our parents. You know, it's their Jesus. That's the Jesus we like. Or the Jesus we imagine. How we think Jesus would probably be, or God forbid, how we think Jesus should probably be. We need to set all of that aside permanently. We need to set all of that aside permanently. Grandmother's Jesus, Daddy's Jesus... Baptist Jesus, American Jesus, our culture Jesus, what I think Jesus ought to be. We need to set all of that aside permanently and get our understanding and knowledge of Jesus solely, solely, solely from the Bible. Only from the Bible. This is our only reliable and trustworthy source of information on Him. And if we're going to add to our moral excellence knowledge, we need to know the Jesus of the Bible. Now, we can see from the Bible at least six things. I told you there were subpoints. Six things about Jesus that we should know. And please hear me when I say these are broad strokes. We're giving broad strokes about Jesus. We don't have time in this life or the life to come to ever plumb the depths of Jesus. We don't have time in this life or the life to come to plumb the depths of even one attribute of Jesus. So these are broad strokes, but I want you to at least get an overview this morning, a 30,000 feet view of Jesus. Number one, he is eternal. He is eternal. Jesus did not come into existence in Bethlehem. Some people think that Jesus came into existence when he was born in Bethlehem and placed in a manger. Jesus did not come into existence then. He came into humanity at that point. He came into our world at that point. But Jesus is eternal. He looked at the Pharisees in the Gospel of John, and they, they said, how in the world can you speak of Abraham? You know, Abraham lived years ago, and Jesus said, surely I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. In John chapter 1, Verses 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning, in the beginning was the Word, capital W. It's not talking about the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. It's talking about the Word, the Logos, the living Word, Jesus Christ Himself. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God the Father. In the beginning, eternity past was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Philippians tells us that he did not count equality with 
God the Father a thing to be grasped or held on to, but he humbled himself. He's existed in eternity past with God the Father in fellowship with the Father and with the Spirit, and he humbled himself and stepped out of that realm into the earthly realm and was born and placed in a manger in Bethlehem. But he's always existed. Don't miss that. He is eternal. Number two, he is not only eternal, but he is creator. He is creator. If you go on in John 1, we read that in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And in verse 3, it says, All things came into being through Him. How did God create in Genesis 1? He spoke. How is Jesus described in John 1? As the Word. He was the active party in creation. God the Father spoke and Jesus the Word created. All things came into being through Him and apart from Him. Nothing came into being that is come into being. In Colossians chapter 1 verses 16 and 17 it says, For by Him all things were created. Both in heavens, that's the angels, the seraphim, the cherubim, and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus Christ is eternal. Jesus Christ is creator. Number three, Jesus Christ is God. He's not sub-God. He's not second-in-command God. He is God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was who? God. Hebrews 1.3, He is the radiance of His glory. Jesus is the radiance of the Father's glory and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. If God the Father was a signet ring, then Jesus Christ is like the clay that ring has been placed into. He is the exact representation of God the Father. Colossians 1.15 says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. God the Father is a spirit, and he does not have a body like a man, but if God the Father were to pass in front of a mirror and cast a reflection, the reflection would be Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. Colossians 2, 9, In him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Not, he's not 50% God, 50% man. No, he's 100% God in the form of man. All of the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form in Jesus Christ. Sometimes we are criticized by Muslims that I know who would say, well, you know, Jesus never said he was God. So how can you say that he's God? Jesus said he was a teacher, he was a prophet. How can you, how can you say that Jesus is God if Jesus never said he was God? We know Paul said what he said about Jesus. We know the author of Hebrews said what he said about Jesus. But Jesus never claimed to be God. And that's because you're reading the, the Bible in the English language and you're not reading the Bible from the perspective of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders of Jesus' day. They heard Jesus say time and time again in their language and in their implications that he was God. In fact, John 10, 33, the Jews answered Jesus, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. I think they got the message pretty clearly that Jesus was making himself out to be God. He's eternal, he's creator, he is God. And don't miss this. He is the subject of the Old Testament. That's number four. He is the subject of the Old Testament. Listen, we don't read the Old Testament because we need to learn the laws of the Jews to be good little boys and good little girls. We don't need to read the Old Testament so that we can keep the ceremonies of the Jews. Because by keeping the ceremonies, we might be more approved by God. We don't read the Old Testament 
to see how the Jews sacrifice so that one day hopefully we can see a temple rebuilt in Jerusalem and they can reinstitute the sacrificial system. No, we don't read the Old Testament for any of those reasons. We read the Old Testament because Jesus Christ is the subject of the Old Testament. When you read the moral law of God, it's not a list of do's or don'ts for you. It's a description of the perfect character of Jesus Christ. When you read the Old Testament and you read about all those feasts and ceremonies, those aren't things for you to do in order to be approved by God. Every one of those feasts, every one of those ceremonies points us to and explains for us Jesus Christ. You don't read the Old Testament to learn about sacrifices and how that's supposed to go down. It all points to the ultimate sacrifice, every detail of Leviticus. Leviticus should be called the Gospel of Leviticus because every one of those sacrifices that bore us, every one of those offerings that bore us, when we read them through the lens of the Old Testament, really point us to Christ. And if we can begin to see Christ in all of those laws and Christ in all of those ceremonies and Christ in all of those sacrifices, the Old Testament comes to life. Not because it's what we're supposed to do, but it's because of who Christ is. The prophecies in the Old Testament, they point us to Christ. Even the narrative in the Old Testament, Christ reveals himself in the narratives. In Genesis chapter 18, for instance, Genesis chapter 18, Abraham goes and sets down under the oaks of Mamre. And it says three men come to him. Two angels who eventually go to Sodom and Gomorrah and drag Lot and his wife out of town before it's destroyed. And the third angel is not just any angel, but he is the angel of the Lord. And Abraham makes a sacrifice there and fire comes from heaven and consumes that sacrifice, that offering, that meal that he gives to these three angels, two angels and the angel of the Lord. Then the two angels depart and the angel of the Lord promises Abraham that he would have a son. And Abraham recognizes that encounter as not an encounter with angels, but an encounter with God himself. Why? Because God came down as not a man, but in bodily form as the angel of the Lord. In Genesis chapter 32, you fast forward, Abraham has had Isaac. Isaac's had Jacob. Jacob and Esau have parted company. Jacob's coming back into his homeland after years away from Esau. And a man meets Jacob in Genesis chapter 32, and he wrestles with Jacob. And that man that wrestled with Jacob is none other than the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ himself. Jacob says, I have wrestled with God and with man. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego wind up in a fiery furnace, heated multiple times hotter than before. Nebuchadnezzar looks into the fiery furnace, and he says, I thought we threw three guys in there. And now there's four. And one walking among them looks like one of the sons of the gods. There's a reason for that Nebuchadnezzar because he's not just a normal guy. He is the son of God. The angel of the Lord. You see, Jesus shows up in the moral law. He shows up in the ceremonial law. He shows up in the sacrificial law. He shows up in the prophecies. He shows up in the stories of the Old Testament. Jesus is the subject of of the Old Testament. And obviously Jesus is the subject of the New Testament. The New Testament is not given to us so that you can live your best life now. The New Testament is not given to us from a very man-centered perspective where what can I get about what can I get out of this? What can I learn about this? What can I apply to my life? No, the New Testament is given to us ultimately first and foremost with a God-centered perspective so we can see Jesus in it. Just in the Gospel of John alone, we find seven statements made by Jesus about who he is. Just in the Gospel of John alone. And he uses the, the, the phraseology that God used in Exodus when he encountered Moses at the burning bush. And he said, you just tell him I am sent you. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Jesus says, I am the light of the world i am the door of the sheep i am the good shepherd i am the resurrection and the life i am the way the truth and the life i am the true vine 
I am the subject of the New Testament. He not only gave seven I am statements, but he gave seven signs that pointed to his deity. He turned water into wine. He healed a nobleman's son. He healed a lame man at the pool of Bethesda. He fed 5,000. He walked on the water to calm the storm. He healed a blind man from birth. He raised Lazarus from the dead. John ends his gospel with these words in John 21, 25. There are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written about him. And the greatest thing Jesus did in the New Testament is obviously not just saying the I am statements and not just working the signs and the wonders and the miracles. The greatest thing Jesus did in the New Testament, the subject of the Gospels, the subject of the New Testament is the reality that Jesus Christ came to this earth to live the sinless, spotless, perfect, holy life that God demands all of us to live and requires all of us to live. And that Jesus not only lived the life that God requires of us, but he went to the cross and was nailed to a cross in our place and he died on that cross for our sin our iniquity our transgressions and he was buried in a borrowed tomb but he didn't stay there because on Sunday morning he bodily victoriously arose from the grave he ascended into heaven and he's at the right hand of the father even now which leads us to the sixth thing we need to see and he's coming again in glory Jesus Christ is eternal. He is creator. He is God. He's the subject of the Old Testament. He's the subject of the New Testament. And he is coming again in glory. Revelation chapter 19, 11 through 16. John wrote, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and wages war his eyes are a flame of fire on his head are many diadems and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself he's clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God and the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen white and clean were following him on white horses and from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the wine press of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written King of Kings Lord of Lords I will not pretend to know all of the details surrounding the end times and nobody else should either but we know that without a doubt Jesus Christ is coming again and he will not come as the Lamb of God to be slain yet again but he will come as the Lion of the tribe of Judah to rule and to reign for all eternity this is the Jesus of the Bible eternal creator God subject of the old subject of the New Testament coming again in glory and we need to know the biblical Jesus We need to know Jesus biblically. Very important, but also insufficient. It's very important to know Jesus biblically, but it is very insufficient. We need to not only know him biblically, we need to know him personally. Personally know him. Why do I say it's insufficient to know Jesus biblically alone? Because the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they knew all about the Messiah. They knew all about the prophecies surrounding the Messiah. They had been praying for the Messiah. They had been looking for the Messiah. They knew all about the Messiah, but they didn't know the Messiah. John is baptizing in the Jordan. And in John 1, 26, John answered these religious leaders, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. Boy, isn't that indicting that the students of the law, the ones who knew the scriptures the best, had Jesus right under their nose and did not even recognize him. And I'm going to propose to you that many of us may have been to Sunday school. We may have been to discipleship training when that was going on. We may have been to WMU. We may have been to Sunday morning church, Sunday night church, Wednesday night prayer meeting, and Bible studies during the middle of the week. But if we can't spot Jesus when he's under our nose, we have an insufficient knowledge of Jesus Christ. You mean to tell you who knows Jesus biblically better than any single solitary one of us in this crowd watching online or anybody alive today? You know who knows Jesus better than anybody alive today? It's the demons. 
The demons know Jesus better than any of us. And they're going to spend eternity in hell. So we need to not only know Jesus biblically, we do need to know the biblical Jesus, but we need to take this second very important step and not only know him biblically, but we need to know him personally. How can we know him personally? I'll give you four C words. Again, these are very broad strokes because we only have one sermon. Number one, we need to personally know Jesus, this biblical Jesus, through conversion. So your first C word is conversion. What does it mean to convert? To convert means that you have been born again by the powerful, sovereign working of the Holy Spirit. Your eyes have been opened to see the glory of God, the holiness of God in your sinfulness and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross for you. And upon that awakening, you then repent of your sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's conversion. It's what you do. You turn and you trust. In Acts chapter 26, the apostle Paul is giving his testimony before King Agrippa. You've probably heard me share this before. He's standing before King Agrippa and he describes the experience on the road to Damascus where he's knocked to the ground and he's told by Jesus there on the road to Damascus that that he would be sent to turn people from darkness to light to to turn people from the power of Satan over to the power of God, that he would be sent so that people could receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in Christ. And Paul said, I was not disobedient to that heavenly vision, King Agrippa, but I did exactly what Jesus told me to do in the regions he sent me to, and I preached, and these are the three things he preached, that men everywhere should repent, turn to God, and do works proving or befitting their repentance. Those were Paul's three points to his sermon he preached on his missionary journeys and throughout all of his ministry. That people should, first of all, repent. To convert means that we repent. We turn. Repentance means we turn away from our sin. We turn away from our old affections. We turn away from our old attitudes. We turn away from our old actions. We turn away from our self-righteous spirit. We turn away from our religiosity. We turn away from our sinful words, our sinful thoughts, our sinful deeds. We turn away from our sin. We do a 180. Now we Baptists, we like to do 360s. Repentance is a 180. We turn this way. We Baptists, we like to turn 180 and keep going and come back to where we started. But repentance is a 180. We're going this way, doing our own thing, and we turn. But where do we turn? Do we turn to Alcoholics Anonymous? Do we turn to Narcotics Anonymous? Do we turn to Gamblers Anonymous? Do we turn to good works? Do we turn to good deeds? Do we turn to self-righteousness? No, we turn from our sin and we trust in, turn to Jesus Christ alone, alone, alone. We don't turn from our sin to the church. We turn to Jesus Christ alone. We don't turn from our sin to a baptism. We turn to Jesus Christ alone. We throw ourselves upon his mercy and upon his grace, trusting in his sacrifice for us on the cross to be absolutely sufficient to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness and bring us into a right relationship with God the Father. We turn from our sin and we turn to God through faith in Jesus Christ. We turn and we trust and then we're transformed as we are made more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. Paul preached everywhere that men should repent, turn to God, and do works that prove they've repented. That's conversion. You want to know Jesus Christ, you will not know him personally until you Personally, not your mama, not your grandma, not your sibling, but you personally convert. You personally take Jesus Christ as your Lord in repentance and in faith. Have you personally, as an individual, in your heart, in sincerity, come to the place where you hate your sin and you love Christ and what he's done for you? Have you come to the place where you've repented of your sin and you've trusted in Jesus and he's changed your life? If not, that's step one for you to know him personally this morning. You need to convert. Number two, 
We know him not only through conversion, but through communion. Now, I'm not talking about the Lord's Supper communion that we're going to take here in a moment, though we do experience the presence of Christ in a special way if we know him, as we remember what he did for us on the cross. I mean, in communication, communion, fellowship, in the sense of communing with him as a person. And it's really not that complicated. We want, to, we want to make it very complicated. But here is how you commune with Christ in a nutshell. Number one, you open up the written word to know the living word. We don't want to go back to the Jesus of our grandparent, whatever that may have been. We don't want to go back to Jesus of our parents, the Jesus of our preacher, the Jesus of our church or denomination or culture. We want to go straight to the Jesus of the Bible, right? So we open the Bible. And we get into the Bible not as an end in itself. The Bible is not an end. We checked it off. We did it this week. I read my Bible every day. The Bible is not an end. The Bible is a means to an end. And the end is Christ. The Bible is a means to the end of knowing Christ. The Bible is a means to an end of hearing from Christ. So we open up the Scriptures. And we approach the Scriptures in humility and pray, God, speak Jesus, speak. We pray. And we stay until we get a word. How many verses should I read today? 20 verses? Two chapters? Four chapters? How much should I read, preacher? You need to read that you hear from Jesus. And sometimes you may read two verses and Jesus hits you between the eyes and you get more benefit out of that than reading six chapters. You pray and you stay until you hear from Jesus. And you obey. That's, that's him communicating to you. This is how easy it is. Scripture intake. And then you talking to him. You speaking to I don't know what to pray. You sit there and talk to Jesus. That's how you pray. You communicate with Jesus. And if you've gone to the scriptures and you've seen something of Christ and you've heard from Christ, you've got something to pray if you don't have anything else. So you listen for him and you speak to him. And then thirdly, you meditate on him. I'm not referring to mystical Eastern meditation. I'm talking about how we have a tendency to open our Bibles. If we do, if we do open our Bibles, read it fast, say a prayer fast so that we can get back on Facebook. No, you need to sit and meditate. In the words of John Bunyan, he said, I've seen the silkworm eat into the leaf and consume it. So ought we to do with the word of the Lord. Not crawl over its surface, but eat right into it till we have taken it into our inmost parts. That's what it means to meditate. You eat right into it. You don't just crawl over it to check it off. Commune with him. And it's not just once, oh, I, need to, I really need to know Jesus this week. I've got a big decision to make. I really need to know Jesus this month. I've got a big decision to make. No. It's a day in and day out communing with Jesus, just like I didn't get this waistline by eating one time at the buffet. But day in and day out, consistently eating, sometimes better, sometimes more, sometimes less. That's how I got this waistline. You want to know how you know Jesus? It's not one trip to the buffet on Sunday morning. But it's going back to the table every day, opening the word to hear from him, getting on your face to speak to him, and then sitting there and soaking up what you hear and what you've gotten from him that day. Number three, not only through conversion and communion, but through communicating. Now, I'm talking about communicating about Jesus. And this is somewhere we probably all fall short. I know I do. But if we want to know Jesus personally, we've got to communicate about Jesus. We've got to bring him along with us. We can't leave him in our closet Leave him in our quiet place where we've been in the scriptures and prayed and meditated and then go out and leave. We just, Jesus, you stay in the closet. Let me lock you in. Now, what if you did your wife that way, man? Don't, please, some of you guys, don't, don't perk up. I'm not giving you marital advice here. You ladies probably more likely to need to lock your husband in the closet. Honey, I love you. Let me give you a little kiss goodbye and lock you in this closet because I'm not taking you out in public. How well are you going to know her? How well are you going to know him? 
And that's what we do with Jesus. We spend a little time with him in the morning. We lock him in a closet. We don't take him with us. We've got to take him out of the closet and learn to take him with us and communicate about Jesus better. In, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will receive power, and you will be my, what? Witnesses. Now, I want you to, don't disconnect the Spirit from what the Spirit is coming upon the followers of Jesus for the purpose of. What is the Spirit coming upon the disciples for? Is it to work miracles? Is it to draw big crowds and get big offerings and buy private jets and have a television program? No. He's, the Holy Spirit is coming upon the followers of Jesus so that they can be what? Witnesses. Now, why on earth would we have the Spirit of Christ? Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ. Why would we have the Spirit of Christ if we are never, ever witnesses? What need do we have of the Spirit of Christ to empower us? But if we're witnesses, here's what it does. If we become witnesses who communicate about Jesus, here's what happens. The Spirit of Christ comes upon us and we begin to know Jesus better through our obedience to His commands. What did He say in Matthew 28? Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And lo, I am what? With you. What is He with you for? The Great Commission. He's with you to make disciples. If we want to experience Jesus personally and know Jesus personally, we need to be witnesses. We need to be disciple makers. We need to be communicating Christ. And as we communicate Christ, as we bring Him along with us, guess what? He becomes more personal and real to us in our walk. And on the flip side of that, not only, not only as we communicate about Him do we experience Him, but as we communicate about Him, we give evidence that we know Him. It's evidencing that we know Him when we speak about Him. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So not only does communicating Jesus bring along the power of Jesus and the personal experience of Jesus, but communicating about Jesus proves that we know Him. We need to communicate. And fourthly, we need to conform. We personally know Jesus through conversion, through communion with Christ, through communicating about Christ, and through conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. As we conform more and more to His image, we not only become like Him, we know Him more. Romans 8, 28, 29. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son. What have we been predestined for if we know Christ? We've been predestined to become conformed to the image of Christ. Let me tell you, what God is most concerned about for all of us here this morning is not our comfort. It's not our comfort. It's not our economy. It's not our health. It's not our happiness. It's not our dreams. It's not our careers. What God is most concerned with this morning is that we be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And he will work in us, through us, around us, and he will do to us whatever needs to happen to make us more like Jesus. Conforming to Jesus' image isn't always easy. Listen to Philippians 3. We're almost done. Philippians 3, 7 through 11. And I want you to notice how many times Paul references Christ and knowing Christ in this passage of Scripture and then how he puts a, puts a lid on it there at the end, so to speak. Philippians 3, 7 through 11, whatever things were gained to me, whatever it was that was gained, those very things that I once considered gain, I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith that I may know Him. 
that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Do you hear what Paul is saying here? In one sentence, Paul is saying, I will give up everything that is near and dear to me, including my life, in order to know Christ and to be with Christ. Knowledge of Jesus is not optional, people. We must know the biblical Jesus personally. This is how important it is to know the biblical Jesus personally. In John 17 and verse 3, Jesus himself said, This is eternal life. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Do you want to know what eternal life is? Eternal life isn't crystal seas. Eternal life isn't streets of gold. Eternal life isn't feasting at the table with all of our relatives who have gone on before. Eternal life is knowing God and knowing Christ. And you can know God and know Christ to an extent now. And when we die and step into eternity, we will spend eternity knowing Him more and more and more and more. Because this morning and this life, and even in the life to come, we will never ever plumb the depths of even one of the glorious attributes of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We will spend eternity knowing Him more and more and more and more. Do you know the Jesus of the Bible? The eternal Creator, God and man, Jesus, the subject of the Old Testament, the subject of the New, who is coming again to rule in power. Do you know Him personally? Are you conforming into His image more and more and more? Are you communicating about Him to others? Are you regularly communing with Him in, in the Scriptures and in prayer and in meditation? Have you been truly, personally converted? Have you turned from your sin? And put your faith and your trust in Christ. And as He transformed your life. Do you know Jesus? We need to add to our moral excellence. Our moral energy. Our vigor. Our activity of the soul. A knowledge of the biblical Jesus. A personal knowledge of the biblical Jesus. Do you know Him this morning? I want you to listen very carefully. If you have one of these little communion cups, I want you to take that out as we close out our time here this morning. And I want you to hear me very carefully. If you have not been personally converted, if you don't personally know Jesus Christ, at least repented of your sin and put your faith and trust in Him and been transformed. This is not for you. This is only for people who have personally been converted. Now, if you haven't been personally converted, we're not excluding you. We want you to watch because we want you to see this. This is not a spoken gospel. This is an acted out gospel. This, this shows us the gospel message. So if you don't know Christ here this morning, we want you to watch. We want you to look. We want you to see the gospel as people who have put their faith and their trust in Christ alone and been transformed by His power and His grace, remember what He's done for them and proclaim what He is doing for them and look forward to the day when He will come yet again. If you'll take that top little clear tab and peel it back, there's a round wafer in there. If you'll just peel back that very top little tab, you'll find this wafer. And I want us before we take it, to think about the reality that this represents the very life of Jesus Christ who came to this earth, born of a virgin, lived a sinless, spotless, perfect, holy, clean life in our place so that we could be made perfect, sinless, spotless, and holy in the, in the eyes of a holy, holy, holy God. That's what Jesus did with his life. He came, he humbled himself, and he lived his life in our place so that we can become the righteousness of God. Let's thank Him for that as we remember His body and His life. Father, we thank You for Christ. Christ, we thank You for humbling Yourself and not counting equality with the Father a thing to be held on to, but You stepped out of heaven and stepped into this cruel, sin-ridden world to live the life 
that is required of us, the life of perfect holiness. We thank you for living that life in our place and for the privilege of having your righteousness put on our account so that we could have peace with God. We thank you for your life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take that wafer and remember the life of Christ. Now there's another tab. If you will peel it back carefully. There's some juice that we recognize as symbolizing the blood of Jesus. As you look at that juice, if you're not converted here this morning, look at those who have that juice and realize that we are not thinking about juice. We're thinking about the blood of Jesus, the precious blood of Jesus that was shed on a cross, an instrument that represented a curse. Not to just cover us from our sin for a time, but to cleanse us from all of our sin, past, present, and future, so that we can have peace with God. Jesus shed his blood so that we can have our sin completely forgiven by his grace, by his mercy. Have you received that this morning? Let's thank God for his blood. Father, we thank you for Christ and the reality that not only did he live the life required of us, but he died the death that our sin deserves. And he shed his blood as the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. We thank you that that blood not only covers our sin, but cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Christ, we thank you for your sacrifice. And it's in your name we pray and ask this. Amen. If you do not know the forgiveness of Christ found in His shed blood and the righteousness of Christ found in the life He lived for you. We want to plead with you, beg you, implore you not to leave this park, not to leave this place without seeing somebody that you trust. We'll be glad to point you to Christ. We're going to pray and some of our pastors will be gathered around uh, near the fountain if you were on your way to, to get your food or to, to eat or to hang out if you just want one of them to talk with you to pray with you don't leave here without seeing one of them we don't want you to leave this place without knowing that you personally know Christ that you've been converted and that you're coming to know him in a more personal way each day let's pray Father we thank you for your grace your mercy your love we thank you for forgiveness we thank you for Christ we thank you for the Bible that helps us to know him and know the truth about him we thank you that we can know him personally because of the gospel. I pray that you would help every person under the sound of my voice to know without a shadow of a doubt that they personally know Christ. And that they're knowing him more each and every day. Converted, communing with him, communicating of him, and conforming more and more to his image. We thank you. We praise you. We pray that you've spoken and worked today in spite of me. And it's in Christ's name we pray and ask these things. Amen. As you're dismissed, you can leave an offering in one of those buckets if you need to do that. If you want to go grab some food and bring it back, it's a beautiful day. There's some games set up. We're going to have folks hanging out. The great hunt will happen around 1 o'clock. And uh, if, you, if you want to be a part of that, we'd love to have you stay in fellowship with us. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for worshiping with us. Hope God's spoken to you from being here together.